years of finding brands that capture a billion. Hello and welcome to Hot Money on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service. This is a show which gets you a complete wrap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. I am Darshan Mehta. Let's welcome our experts then. Samir Kaldra of Target Investing, Ritesh Ashur of KIFS Securities and uh, KIFS uh, and Trade, trade Capital uh, and Avinash Gorashikar of Joinder Capital join me on the show. Thank you all for joining me on the show. Today on Hot Money, we'll discuss Bajaj Finance, which came out with numbers yesterday. It's the top trading Nifty stock in trade today. Biocon has corrected significantly from the top. Uh, our valuations are concerned. Uh, is there more downside possible in Biocon? TVS Motor came out with its number, reported strong set of numbers. We analyzed the numbers and what it means for the other auto companies that will report numbers. And the top pick in the real estate space is something that we are seeing. The first stock that we want to talk about, and that is Bajaj Finance, came out with numbers yesterday. Today, uh, pretty much in line set of numbers, but the management commentary was pretty strong. The counter down up almost to six percent, trading pretty much at the day's high. What what did you make of the number, and what's the trend going ahead? We'll ask our experts. So, Samir, uh, what's your view on uh, Bajaj Finance? Uh, what did you make of the numbers? So, I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, if you see the AUM, the NIMS, they are all on the control growth. Uh, if you hear the management and even read whatever they have given the interviews on. Uh, they are talking about the cost increases in next quarter onwards, which didn't come through this mm. quarter. So I think over there, I would like to see the quarter three and uh, see how the cost pressures are mm. being forwarded to the mm. retail end of the customers, mm. because the corporate will be much more difficult. Mm. So I think over there, that's a point. The asset quality has deteriorated to mm. a small extent, but does that trend continue from mm. here on? So. Uh, these two things I am much more conscious on. Uh, we hold it at a very much lower levels, but we will not add it on this kind of a result. Okay. Uh, Avinash, you have a minute, uh, your view on uh, Bajaj Finance. What did you make of the numbers? And I will come back to you for a follow-up. No, I think numbers were in line with expectations. And I think uh, asset quality, uh, despite the fact that it was slightly you know, marginally up, I think uh, the comfort factor was the management commented that ILFS exposure is not very large and uh, they have adequate resources to provide for it. So I think all in all the numbers appeared good and the management commentary as you said rightly Darshan in terms of the loan book growth, in terms of the disbursement, I think clearly although you know interest rates may go up and yields may definitely be impacted, I think uh, definitely this is a stock to definitely look out if possibly there's a further correction and definitely looks to be a good portfolio kind of choice. Okay and uh, Ritesh, you have a minute, what did you make of the numbers? Uh, see, I'm very impressed with the numbers compared to the peer groups. If you look at the AUM has almost uh, grown by 38%, which is surpassing 1 lakh crores of AUM. Simultaneously, profit has also increased by almost uh, 16%. Loan book mm. has increased by almost 54%. So looking at the way the loan book has increased and the asset under management have been increased by 38%, and the gross NPA net NPAs is also quite uh, in line with an expectation. So on the number perspective, I'm very uh, positive uh, on the Bajaj Finance. Okay, so I think uh, that's the trend that's coming in. We'll open it up uh, for discussion. Uh, uh, Valuation-wise, Ritesh, uh, is it expensive? Still expensive? Uh, see, valuation-wise, if you look at it, overall NBFC hmm. were expensive. If you talk about the stock specific, the market P is running at around 34% in the NBSC sector, uh, wherein Bajaj uh, Finance is running at around 41.85%. So I'm very comfortable in terms of uh, P prospective. In terms of uh, ROE is almost growing by almost uh, 17 to 18% in between and EPS is around 16%. So fundamentals point of view, I'm quite bullish. But the sector point of view, it is going to be quite challenging for next uh, two quarters looking at the regulatory issues. You, th you think, uh, Avinash, next two quarters will be tough? What did you make of the management commentary? Will they be able to tide the liquidity crunch that's going on and the rising interest rate scenario? See, I think on both these fronts, Darshan, I think for a quality player like Bajaj Finance, uh, liquidity should not be a problem. And I think uh, in case of rising interest rates, I think uh, as Samir pointed out, you know, the yields would definitely get impacted. But uh, I think they have reasonable amount of uh, leverage to possibly, you know, uh, encounter that kind of, uh, you know, interest rate hike. The important part is that I think clearly in terms of the ILFS exposure, uh, they are not that badly impacted. 
uh, most importantly the kind of segments they operate i would believe that maybe for a couple of quarters you know growth may definitely appear to be little tempered but going forward if this stock uh, if it all corrects basically, basically uh, due to the market sentiment and probably on expectations that provisions you know which in this quarter shot up quite significantly that possibly trajectory could continue i would still look at it from a long term point of view over the next 12 to 18 months uh, one could definitely look at making good amount of money here but yes as samir pointed out maybe at on a, some sort of a price correction not at the current level yeah what sort of valuation would you be comfortable on bajaj finance so uh, right now if you see it's still around 4.5 to 5.5 kind of a range since past 3 yeah. months uh, its average on a 5 year average has been traded at 3 and a half 4 and a half so there's still kind of a 15 20% kind of a downside from here hmm. which makes it much more on a average basis uh we generally buy stocks certain places when they come to a discount hmm. uh so i think another yeah. quarter or two will give you a better picture in the valuation terms but if you see uh like they have mentioned that now the cost will go to 8.5 to 8.8 hmm. which is right now 8.2 hmm. so how around 45% of their book is uh increase repriceable so they have to take a substantial increase in prices mm. how that impacts the aum growth that's much more a uh, bigger situation which we would like to see before taking a call on the stock what do you make of the management commentary so if you see the management commentary they were clear on how, what kind of a source of funds they create mm. and mm. they are very comfortable with that situation because if you see a lot of book comes from bajaj auto and consumer led mm. so that's around 2 to 3 year kind of a horizon kind of a book mm. so i think as the proportion increases they'll be much more comfortable the uncomfortable is they're still dependent on cps mm. uh, we would like it to move from cps to maybe a bank side kind of a loan fund raising so that the next year it takes for the re uh, changing of the proportions mm. so i think if they get that done i think liquidity is not a issue for this company okay and and just before we end uh, well, how how important is competition now because uh, the news report that come out that uh, hdfc subsidiary hdb financial is also uh, you know matching bajaj finance everywhere in where they are present so uh, is that not a concern that growth probably will taper down on a existing high base for them see if you look at overall sector perspective uh, the challenges for the nbfc will be like it's a gro- uh, low growth and high uh, cost of funding because the lending has been done by the bank and due to island fs issues uh, it has the regular Regulation has become more uh, tighten up in terms of disbursement. If we look at uh, the NBFC uh, disbursement, uh, it has already uh, cut it down for the uh, FI19 prospective in terms of targets. I personally feel 200 to 500 BPAs in terms of target have been reduced by all the NBFCs. Mm-hmm. Uh, current scenario, the liquidity and in terms of disbursement is a big challenge for all the NBFC uh, prospective. So I personally feel right now uh, to get into the strong uh, book like Bajaj Finance mm-hmm. and SGFC, that will be the strong recommendation rest all needs to be stay away okay so that's the view that's coming in on bajaj finance uh, buy on dips or accumulate now also so so the, the thing seems to be the, the prospect seems to be on the better side for bajaj finance so remember it's a top nifty gainer it's up 6% in uh, trade today yesterday also it did manage to close in the slight positive next stock we want to talk about is biocon now biocon has corrected significantly from the top uh, that we had seen uh, but uh, obviously valuation concerns remain on biocon one of the most expensive pharma stocks uh, uh, that we have uh, obviously uh, they have ma- managed to launch a couple of products uh, and the pipeline will come in uh, results are there tomorrow but what should one do on biocon uh, do you like biocon uh, or do you find it expensive no i think uh, definitely i think valuations don't appear cheap uh, darshan and i think uh, you know as you mentioned the buy similar opportunity is a big trigger i think the market should obviously await for some more clarity and a final <coughs> approval for this uh, buy similar kind of opportunity so despite the numbers i would say that uh, you know uh, investors who actually hold on to the stock should hold on i don't think any uh, core uh, you know earnings drivers could possibly be seen tomorrow uh, market should obviously like to get some more commentary on the new molecule and the buy similar opportunity okay what about you ritesh biocon any uh, view my view will be quite uh, contra in this i feel uh, it is very expensive mm. so i would recommend it in terms of avoid as of now if you look at the market pe is running at around 28 wherein the biocon pe is running at around 91 mm. so that is uh, quite expensive per se in terms of uh, eps will talk about it's hardly 3.90 mm. so i feel uh, in terms of growth uh, it's hardly reported 2% uh, profit due to higher increasing the cost of interest and the depreciation cost which has increased to 40 
24% in the balance uh, balance sheet. So I'm not comfortable in terms of the cost have been increased by 44% drastically due to depreciation and the interest mm. cost. Uh, in terms of performance, because of that reason, it has affected to the profit margin. So I feel uh, about this counter as of now, it is looks to be quite expensive. But yes, the fundamental, the management commentary is like uh, FI19 is going to be a strong go tra uh, growth trajectory. But I feel 10 to 15% correction is st uh, still due in this counter. And what about you? Uh, what do you make of, uh, what do you do in with Biocon? So I think Biocon is true led. Uh, the valuations right now accounts for the news which are coming on and the approvals which are coming on. So that gives the benefit of doubt to the Biocon that future earnings will show this kind of an improvement. If you see the present earnings, they are flattish <coughs> past couple of years and uh, there are higher expenses which are being incurred because of the R&D expenses. So I think on the fundamental basis, I see a downside kick in. Uh, when that downside kicks in, maybe a disappointment on results will show that. Uh, on the biosimilars, I will only play when the, resu when the results account for that. So that's, I think, six to nine months mm -hmm. ahead. So till that time, I would avoid it. Uh, okay, so that's the view. I think it's a consensus view that uh, uh, Biocon valuations are expensive, uh, can be avoided, but we'll open it up for questioning. Uh, uh, everyone's playing on this biosimilar pipeline, but, but at the end of the day, uh, majority of the products where they have, they will be more like a yeah. contract manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, the, the bulk of the profits or will go to <coughs> Mylan <coughs> and it will sink. Uh, uh, does it warrant such a valuation on that front? So that's, uh, that's where I'm saying, so <coughs> it's more on the potential of the markets which these kind of uh, approvals hmm. are addressing. That's what a part is coming out here. Because right now the results are not showing that uh, production or that contract manufacturing mm. profits into the numbers. That will somewhere disappoint because again, mm. these are more joint approvals. These mm. are not approvals on the biocon level. Mm. So I think there's a disappointment on the potential downside risk more than the upside risk. Uh, anything that you like in the pharma space? So we hold uh, Sun Pharma as such. Uh, we've reduced the weights. Uh, but I think Sun Pharma is a place where uh, certain things are getting started and the inspections are happening quite often, which are more of pre-approval mm. from my understanding. So I think over there when the settlements happen and the Illumina uh, got launched mm. recently, so I think numbers will show much more quickly in the results than other specialty products. Ritesh, uh, uh, obviously Biocon is an avoid for you. Anything that you are recommending your clients in the pharma space to accumulate at this level? Yes, definitely we are recommending a Sun Pharma. The reason behind is the Sun Pharma, uh, it's amongst the top five in terms of genetic medicine. Mm. If you look at the US uh, genetic medicine sale, the 40% is contributed by the India in terms of export. Uh, while due to rup uh, rupee, uh, rupees depreciating, the maximum benefit is comes to the Sun mm. Pharma in terms of the export of the total medicine is almost mm. 60% of the total weightage. Uh, in terms of UK, the 25% of the medicine have been exported from India itself. Mm. So I personally feel on a long-term perspective, Sun Pharma performance and the structures is quite uh, healthy uh, compared to the other peer groups. Uh, simultaneously, the US FDA approval was uh, pending from last almost six months, uh, six to eight months, which has also been approved. So that mar profit margins and the order book value will be resulted in coming quarters. So I'm quite bullish into the Sun Pharma. What about you, Avinash? Anything that uh, you are recommending to your clients in the pharma space. Biocon obviously is something that you all don't. Uh... No, in fact, uh, clearly, you know, I think uh, within the uh, Indian pharma companies, we like Olympic Pharma. Okay. I think uh, pretty strong numbers, Darshan. I think if you see the Q2 numbers, uh, a very strong top line growth of 23% uh, and a profit after tax of almost 200 crores. So I think year valuations <laughs> definitely look uh, reasonably good, you know, if one look at one were to look at the next eight, 12 to 18 months. So I think at this level, the risk reward definitely looks good. Okay, so that's the view that's coming in. Sun Pharma and Olympic Pharma over Biocon at this point of time. The next talk that we want to talk about is TVS Motors. Uh, numbers came in, pretty decent set of numbers. The manager counter managed to react, but today it's uh, reacting negatively. Uh, that's the view that's coming in. Ritesh, uh, uh, in the two-wheeler space, uh, what did you make of TVS's numbers? Uh, see, definitely in terms of n numbers point of view, uh, profit more or less in line with an uh, mm. expectation. The best part was the revenue growth by almost 22%. That was uh, something very impressive. The, the revenue has uh, started increasing. Simultaneously, margin has also more or less as uh, intact. Uh, profit after tech has also uh, reaches to 18% in terms of EBITDA. Uh, in terms of uh, export, it has increased by 20%, which is quite mm. positive sign uh, when the result has declared. In terms of two-wheeler uh, space, the overall sales
sales growth has been increased by 17%. That is also quite uh, impressive. Mm. The two-wheeler sales have been distributed by in the three uh, different parameters. One is in terms of motorcycle, another one is in terms of three-wheeler and the <coughs> overall two-wheeler. Uh, if you look at two-wheeler per se, it has almost increased by 18% of the sales. Uh, by 3,500 uh, 3, units to, it has increased to almost 4,000 plus units. Uh, in terms of motorcycle, it has almost grown by 22%. That is also fantastic into the segment of 70% mm. overall. Three-wheeler space, it has been increased by 22% compared to last two quarters, which is quite impressive in terms of execution. So I feel personally, uh, in terms of numbers which I have declared, profit, is it is in line, but revenue growth, it is quite impressive. Okay, Avinash, what did you make of TVS's number? I'll come back to you. Wanna come back I think push. numbers were pretty good, but uh, what uh, the street was expecting was uh, possibly some stability in the EBITDA margins. I think due to rising commodity prices, uh, margins took a marginal hit of almost 30 basis points. And uh, I think clearly uh, in terms of the further incremental growth, I think uh, one would like to see how the rural markets and the urban markets pans out because there have been some reports on the ground that uh, volumes, especially in the festive season, have actually not taken off uh, you know, as per the street mm. expectation. So I think going forward, it's going to be a little tougher and uh, the stock has already moved up quite significantly. So you know, I wouldn't like to buy fresh into this stock. Now, what about you, Samir? What do you make of the numbers? So I think it was mixed. For me, it's more on the downside. Uh, if you see September quarter, last year was also the highest mm. because this is a pre-festival buying which kicks mm. in. Uh, the three wheelers is the major margin mm. push which they get uh, because the <coughs> derail, uh, the license removals mm. in certain places gave the boost to Bajaj Auto and TVS mm. at the same place. On the other side, if I see the balance sheet, that has deteriorated. So the debt has increased by 150 crores mm. on the overall. Uh, the receivable days have gone up from 22 days to 30 days. Mm. That's a substantial upside. So that means you're sacrificing your cash flow mm. just to get more revenue and a higher margin, which we don't prefer. And I think there's a kind of a push on the sales. Mm. I think that might kick out in December quarter. Okay, so that's the view that's coming in on TBS Motors. Ritesh, uh, uh, valuation-wise, the most expensive two-wheeler stock. Uh, well, I think, uh, let's leave Aisha apart, but uh, valuation-wise also yes, not the def cheapest. Yes, definitely. Uh, would that bother you? Uh, definitely in terms of valuation wise it is quite expensive if you look at the price to book value it is running at around 8.94 uh, simultaneously if you look at ROE it is quite impressive to 23% uh, so I feel personally at the current market sentiment uh, in terms of uh, if the price get corrected by almost 10% it is considered to be a fair value uh, in terms of numbers have been reported for the quarter two it is really good so number perspective the fundamental shows it is quite good uh, when it comes to the buying opportunity we have to wait and watch for the uh, few days mm. where the market sentiment and if you are getting in some good buying opportunity at the downtrend by 5 to 10 percent at the current market price then I feel it is a good uh, stock to add it to your portfolio. What about your valuation wise uh, which would be your uh, pecking order in two wheelers? I think uh, pecking order I think I would still uh, prefer something like a hero motor cop and obviously Bajaj Auto I think clearly uh, you know for a company which has a single digit EBITDA margin compared to both the uh, peers <coughs> This stock definitely looks expensive, Darshan. So I would prefer to wait for a correction, if at all, if I want to add it. Okay, and, and the last space that we want to talk about is the real estate space. Uh, most of the counters in the real estate space of late have gotten hammered, uh, be it their own issues and the issues with the NBFC lending and the defaults that uh, have come in. But, uh, but uh, we want to discuss which is the top pick as far as the real estate space is concerned. Uh, so, Samir, uh, if you had to bet on a real estate stock, which one that would that be? So, I wouldn't bet right now, but uh, <coughs> we're looking at DLF. Uh, the valuations are going down mm -hmm. uh, with the correction in the market. So, I think there's a further downside also. The plus side which I'm seeing is the cash flow generation which will come out of the reduction in debt. So, uh, waiting for this uh, this quarter results and half year balance sheet to come out. I think over there the land bank and the NCR uh, uh, pricing which has gone up by 3-4% to 4 <coughs> this quarter is helping them out. Uh, the results might be muted on the uh, YOY basis because of the commercial mm. assets being mm. given out to the P. I think over there that kind of a potential of DLF is there but I would wait for a 120-100. What, what's the trigger for DLF according to you? Three, so, four important triggers that you feel so that the I think the main is the huge reduction on the 
books, uh, debt, uh, debt on the books, hmm. that is the main trigger for us because the cash flow generation increases by that much hmm. itself. So that will be there. Second is the NCR sales and the pricing are still stabilized. So I think if that is consistent for a couple of quarters, I think that will be there. There are two launches of the green uh, DLF Greens project and two phases coming up. That should give uh, another boost for them in shorter term. So I think six to three to six months kind of a view first start to buying kind of that kind of a place. I think DLF is. Do you, do you all own anything in your personal port or in your uh, client account or something? DLF as of now. No. Okay, that's the view that's coming in. Ritesh, uh, in the real estate space, what are you all liking? Uh, see, uh, frankly speaking, uh, in terms of overall uh, real estate uh, sector, the effect of uh, RERA is still uh, not uh, equipped. In terms of uh, investor point of view, the effect of RERA it is quite positive. Hmm. But in terms of uh, developer point of view, there are a lot of regulatory uh, costs have been increased. Hmm. Simultaneously, uh, cash flow uh, due to the regulation, I have to uh, adequate amount of cash flow in hand in terms of launching for the new project or existing project to be hmm. uh, deployed. At the same time, I have to follow the deadline at the regulatory requirement uh, point of view. So I feel the impact in overall uh, real estate se sector is still more to go because, because of the liquidity crunches and the lower demand per se. Hmm. Uh, if we look at uh, the buying opportunity, my bet will be more into the God, uh, Godrej property. Okay. The reason of Godrej property, they have a very good pipeline in terms of new projects. Okay. The demand of the project is uh, quite high in the industry. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when the sectors are more into the consolidation, they are very good in terms of acquisition of the new project. Okay. And they have enough uh, cash flow in hand uh, in terms of fulfill the requirement of the regulatory. Mm -hmm. So I personally feel in terms of Godrej property, it is a good fundamental stock in terms of real estate sector. Uh, any risks that uh, you run into Godrej properties compared to others? Where the company is already having an adequate amount of cash in hand uh, in terms of project are also in demand, sales are also uh, doing quite fantastic, ROE is also quite decent compared to the other peer group. So I don't find any uh, risk per se for this sector. Okay, so uh, DLF Godrej uh, properties and what about you Avinash? Uh, in fact, we like a company called Suntech Reality. In okay. fact, uh, Darshan, this has been one company which has been a front runner in the BKC uh, area and after BKC now they have started looking at projects especially in the old DC uh, and they have uh, launched an affordable project in Naigao. Now what is interesting is uh, about two months back when they launched the Naigao project, you know, it was sold out in a month. Almost 70% of the bookings uh, has been encashed by the company. And in terms of leverage, which is very important in the real estate space, you know, they have a very low leverage of almost 0.19. Uh, so I think clearly in this challenging space, uh, you know, in this uh, scenario, when uh, interest rates are going up and hopefully, you know, when uh, funding is not available easily, I think uh, they have a very strong balance sheet and uh, you know hopefully if execution is strong one could definitely see these kind of uh, you know pipeline of projects actually benefiting the company over the next 18 to 24 months so what's the risk if someone is looking to take a position in suntech i would believe that you know it's only execution if there is any let up in the execution darshan that could be a problem because in terms of the funding uh, they have their cash flows ready uh, they have liquidity on their side only thing is if at all there is an execution problem on the affordable size project because mm. that uh, although it's a JDA, I would believe that that is one uh, you know project where the management does not have any hands-on experience. They have been largely been operating on the luxury and the ultra luxury segment. So market should obviously look at how this execution. And the finances itself. tend to be bulky for SunTech, right? Because yeah, but the... I mean if you look at the balance sheet as of uh, March 2018, I think clearly you know they uh, definitely don't have a very large component of debt, and most of their lenders are most of the private sector banks. So they don't have uh, larger dependence on any NBFC so funding has been pretty solid. Okay so that's the view that's coming in on the real estate sector. Uh, Suntech Realty, Godrej Properties and DLF are the stocks that have been spoken about but with that uh, it's a wrap on today's Hot Money. Samir, Avinash and uh, Ritesh thank you so much for coming into the show today. Ask BQ comes up next. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint. Good news guys! 